I would go against a bullet for my children. I would. That's why Pat Curry didn't scare me. And I told her that. I said, you don't scare me. She told me I'm going to kill you. I said, well, do it, bitch. Go ahead and do it. That's what I told her. So she knew I wasn't going to be frightened of her. But, I mean, I was scared. I carried this in my purse. See it right here? It says, Pat Curry, 630 North Boshen, in case of my death. This is her. Carried that in my purse for years. <laughs> it's all beat up. I stopped carrying it when she went to prison. In the last episode, we learned about an unusual Boshen resident named Patricia Curry. In 2016, at age 75, Patricia tried to kill her attorney with a shotgun. But people claimed she'd been causing problems long before that. One of those people was a former DEA agent named Skip Sewell. Skip had had a few run-ins with Patricia himself, and he believed she may have played a role in Margaret Kuhn's death. But then he discovered a police report that changed everything. The report suggested that, at the time Margaret was killed, Patricia was holding a young woman against her will in Boshen, and Skip believed that finding her might lead to a breakthrough in the case. I'm Jed Lipinski. This is Gone South, Season 1, Who Killed Margaret Kuhn? Episode 7, Death Threats. The young woman Skip was trying to find was named Kim Mervich. In his days with the DEA, Skip had tracked down high-level cartel bosses and infiltrated violent drug gangs in New Orleans. And yet, he admitted that locating a middle-aged woman in St. Bernard Parish was a struggle. Kim was somewhat of a ghost. Uh, I ran her through a bunch of databases, and uh, it didn't really reveal anything about her current whereabouts. Kim's mother, however, was easy to find. A record search revealed she was living in Ponchatoula, a small city just down the road from St. Tammany. So I just got in the car with another investigator and I drove up there and and knocked on her door. Her mother turned white when I told her why I was there. She had had quite a few dealings with Patricia Curry also, and uh, she had quite a story. They were looking at me like I was some kind of nut. And he said, well, your name is all over all of the, the records in there. I said, oh, why, why would that be? And I, I don't know. I, and he said, well, I, I would love to hear what went on with you. This is Faye St. Germain, Kim Mervich's mother. She worked as a hairdresser for more than 30 years in St. Bernard Parish, a working class community that sits next to the Lower Ninth Ward on the east bank of the Mississippi River. Faye raised three children in St. Bernard with her first husband, But by the mid-1980s, her marriage was falling apart. I was married to my first husband for 17 years, very abusive man, and I had to get my three children away from him. And that seemed to be what started with all of the mess. Um, After my divorce, uh, my oldest girl, Kim, wanted to leave. I think that she just wanted to get away from that environment of what we were going through. I told her, just keep in touch with me and I'm fine with that. You know, she was 19 and I trusted her to keep in touch with me. According to Faye, Kim left home in the summer of 1986. She found a job as a receptionist for an eye doctor in Mandeville and moved into a condo complex near the lakefront. By that fall, however, Kim had fallen out of touch Faye realized her car, which was registered under Faye's name, was behind on payments and was about to be repossessed. So she had given me numbers to call, and all the numbers were disconnected. So I called the police in Covington, where they told me, oh, you know, she's 19 now, and 
you know, it's not going to, she's probably went off with her friends. You know, they just kind of disregarded everything I was telling them. So I wanted to put in a, a missing persons report and they discouraged me. They discouraged me. So Faye and her other daughter, Jenny, went looking for Kim. We got in the car and we went across the lake and we, we combed the little condos where she said she was looking for the car and it was not there. So I, I said, now what are we gonna do? Faye then called the eye doctor who Kim worked for. And the doctor said, no, no, she doesn't work for me anymore. She's living in Boshen with an elderly woman. So Faye and Jenny drove to Boshen. They explained their situation to the security guard at the gate, a woman named Linda. Linda sympathized, Faye said, and directed them to Patricia Curry's condominium at 630 North Boshen Drive. Sure enough, Kim's red Chevy Nova was parked outside. And there was the car. Jenny and I get out my car, and we beat on the door, beat on the door, and looked like she wasn't going to open it. And um, she finally came to the door. We, we didn't even recognize her. She had gotten real thin and terrible looking. You know, she looked sickly. So I said, let us in. You know, I'm really, I'm really uh, in, forceful with my kids. I said, let, let us in. But when I got in there, I looked around and everything was like manly, like a, a, a hunting lodge or something. And over the, over the her fireplace was a sawed-off shotgun. And down the hall was shotguns on the wall. And I said, oh, my God, Kim, who is this person? Who, who, who is this person? She said, Pat Curry. Faye sensed that her daughter was in serious trouble, and her fears increased when they walked back outside. The area, Faye noticed, looked eerily familiar. I remember seeing it a month before on, on TV. I turned around to the street, and I said, you know, Kim, someone was just murdered in Boshen. She said, yes, Mama. It was right at the end of the driveway. I said, at the end of this driveway? She said, yes. I said, oh my God, Kim. Faye asked where Kim was the night of the murder. And Kim told her a strange story. On the day Margaret was killed, Kim said, Patricia had gotten in touch with her. She explained that her jealous ex-girlfriend had just called and threatened to harm Kim if she stayed in the condo. So Patricia told her to leave and meet her in Baton Rouge. Kim told me that she had called and told Kim, get out of that condo, get out, come to Baton Rouge. And they went and ate in a restaurant that night and she kept the receipt. And Kim thought that was kind of weird that she kept the receipt. But she did. That was all Kim was willing to share, and Faye didn't press the issue. But she was terrified someone might try to kill Kim if she stuck around. And I said, oh, Kim, you have to come home with us. Oh, no, 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 I'm not leaving. So we begged her, and she just wouldn't budge. So uh, my daughter and I went home across the lake just crying. We didn't know what was going to happen. Faye was desperate, but she was determined to save her oldest daughter. This is where my quest began, to find find uh, the truth about everything, to find out about the woman she was staying with. And I, I, I just, I was so tenacious, uh, I had to find that out. So Faye started investigating Kim's relationship with Patricia Curry. My sister and I, uh, her husband... <laughs> Her husband, we found out that they hung out at this ball on Elysian Fields. Charlene's. Yeah. And my sister's husband worked on, on the rigs. So the, uh, his van was full of hard hats and stuff like that. We put the hard hats on. And we just drove around waiting to see if Pat Curry was going to come out. We stayed in the parking lot for a little while, and we never did see her come out. Faye then went back to Linda, the sympathetic Boshen security guard. According to detailed notes that Faye took at the time, Linda and the other guards liked Kim. 
They couldn't understand how she'd gotten mixed up with someone like Patricia Curry. Linda told Faye that Kim had moved in sometime in January 1987. Patricia worked in Baton Rouge, Linda said, and stayed in an apartment there during the week, leaving Kim alone in her condo while she was gone. Patricia also took the house phone with her to Baton Rouge, Linda said, so that Kim couldn't make calls. Faye asked Linda if she thought Kim was being held hostage. Linda didn't think so. She thought it was some kind of, quote, lesbian thing. But if Kim were her daughter, she'd be worried. For Faye, the next year passed in a blur of fear and anxiety. She spoke to Kim only sporadically. On a few occasions, Kim called her collect from gas stations near Boshen, pleading with Faye to pick her up. But she always called back minutes later, telling her not to come. She said that Patricia would hurt her if she left. According to Faye, things reached a head in the late summer of 1988. Kim had agreed to visit Faye on Labor Day and had borrowed her grandmother's car for the trip. But when Labor Day arrived, Kim failed to show. Faye was hysterical. She called Boshen security and threatened to file a stolen vehicle report unless Kim or Patricia Curry called her back. Half an hour later, Kim called in tears. Faye says she could hear Patricia Curry yelling in the background, telling Kim to, quote, hang up on the bitch. Before Kim did so, she told Faye she would never speak to her again. Faye didn't know where to turn. The cops were no help, and she'd done all she could on her own. So she decided to call a family friend for advice. The friend worked as a deputy sheriff in Jefferson Parish, just across the river from New Orleans. He recommended Faye talk to a private investigator he knew. So he called me and he said, listen, I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine who just retired. And he lives on the North Shore. And he's doing undercover work. And um, I know that he would be glad to help you. He said his name is Gary Raymond. Faye's only intention in hiring Gary Raymond was to get her daughter back. But Gary would turn out to be valuable for another reason. By examining Patricia Curry, he would stumble onto one of the most bizarre theories in the long history of the Margaret Kuhn investigation. Faye wasn't sure what a private investigator did exactly, but when her friend suggested a meeting near her home in St. Bernard, Faye eagerly agreed. We met at a restaurant, the Sizzler, and um, I brought Kim's picture, and that's all I, I had. I, and I, I didn't know anything other than that her name was Pat Curry. As Faye recalls, Gary took the case on the spot. He lived just two blocks from Boshen, and he had an idea about how to get past the guards. He said, look what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to go in at Boshen, and um, I can go in there dressed as a priest. And they'll let me in, he said, and I can go through their garbage <laughs> and find out, you know, stuff about them with the, the garbage. I said, all right. Why a, why a priest? Because that might be more, he'd be viewed more sympathetically if he showed up in a priest robe. Oh, I don't know if he was in a robe, but maybe with a collar. Yeah, I don't know. Gary's priest disguise got him inside, but Patricia Curry's garbage failed to produce any leads. So he tried another tactic. And then he went in one time as a uh, electrical, and he was up on a pole. He was listening to the conversation. So he was, what, intercepting a phone call that Pat was making? Yeah. Did he hear anything useful on the phone? Nope. At first, it seemed like Gary Raymond was just having fun, reliving his days as an undercover cop. He thought Kim was a runaway and would come back soon enough. But as he dug deeper into the case, his attitude shifted. After he realized what he was dealing with, with the murder, and it being right there, he sort of taken everything real seriously. He said, look, I'm going to keep in touch with you twice a week. He said, I'm going to keep an eye on your daughter. I said, great, this is great. He really became obsessed with this case. He really did. He was really tenaciously involved with it. We couldn't let it go. By the summer of 1988, Gary Raymond had compiled a small dossier on the Kim Mervich and Patricia Curry situation. On September 6th, 
he relayed what he knew to the Mandeville Police Department. According to the police report, Gary noted that Patricia was believed to have a variety of guns and knives in her home. He added that Patricia had made death threats against both Kim and her mother, should Kim ever attempt to move out. The Mandeville PD took Gary's concerns seriously. They forwarded the information to the St. Tammany Sheriff's Office, who took over the case. Based on Gary's report, detectives agreed they needed to interview Kim Mervich, and they wanted to do it when Patricia Curry wasn't around. A background check had revealed that Kim had an outstanding warrant for failing to pay a traffic ticket, so detectives hatched a plan. They would send a young deputy to Curry's condo to arrest Kim, then bring her to the Covington jail for questioning. It was a good plan, but they ran into trouble right away. A police report notes that as the deputy approached Curry's condo, he was accosted by her dog, a large white chow chow, and had to run it off with his baton. When Kim answered the door, the deputy said she appeared, quote, extremely nervous. Kim agreed to come down to the station. As she was getting dressed, however, Patricia's black mercury screeched into the driveway. She insisted on bringing Kim to the station herself. The deputy refused. Instead, Patricia followed his patrol unit to the jailhouse and bonded Kim out, but not before she was questioned by Detective Jay Daigle who was then the lead detective on the Margaret Kuhn case. Like so many people in this story, Jay Daigle is no longer living. But according to a transcript of the interview, which lasted only minutes, Detective Daigle's first question was, did you know the woman who was stabbed about a year ago near here, Margaret Kuhn? No, Kim replied, with what the transcript records as a heavy quiver in her voice. Kim added that she'd only heard about the murder when she read about it in the paper. She said Patricia had kept the news clipping because the incident happened nearby. At this point, Kim shut down. She told Daigle, I think I want to have an attorney. With that, the interview was over. Two months later, in December of 88, Detective Daigle paid a surprise visit to Faye St. Germain's house in St. Bernard Parish. While Kim was still in the condo with Pat Curry, Jay Daigle, a policeman from Covington, and an FBI agent, they came to my house in St. Bernard and laid out about six different pictures of women and asked me if I knew any of them. And I said, no, I'm a know these people. And they said, well, this is Pat Curry. This is Rose Gleason. Rose Gleason and Pat Curry had an ongoing fight. Okay. I, I don't know him. How am I know him? You know? So that's how I heard about Rose Gleason. Faye had never heard of Rose Gleason, but Detective Daigle had a good idea of who she was. By then, he had pulled Patricia Curry's criminal history, and it suggested that she and Rose Gleason were lovers who'd had a dramatic falling out. The police reports are handwritten and difficult to read, but from what we can tell, Patricia and Rose had it out in May 1984. That month, Patricia apparently accused Rose of harassing her over the phone. Rose was arrested shortly thereafter. When Rose appeared in court, however, she refuted Patricia's allegations. According to a police report, Rose claimed that Patricia had, quote, tried to choke me to death in the parking lot of a Delachamps supermarket. She told police that she didn't report the incident at first, because Patricia had threatened to kill her if she did. But the most interesting report was filed on March 12, 1987, three weeks after Margaret Kuhn's death. On that day, Patricia Curry told the sheriff's department that a woman had called her at work and threatened to kill the girl staying at her condominium. Patricia said the caller's name was Rose. At their next meeting, Faye told Gary the PI about Rose Gleason. A quick record search revealed that she was a registered nurse in her 40s who had lived for a time in Baton Rouge. But when Gary inquired into her current whereabouts, he learned something interesting. Shortly after Margaret Kuhn's murder, Rose appeared to have moved away. Gary Raymond told me, isn't this convenient? I'm hearing that Rose Gleason left the state and she moved to California. I said, oh my lord, right after the murder, she just took off and left. Still, Faye wondered, why would Rose Gleason want to murder Margaret Kuhn? 
That's when Gary mentioned something else he'd discovered. When Gary was working for me, he took Kim's picture and that Tom's Picayune layout of the whole story. He looked at that. He said, look at this. He said, they look so much alike. He said, this could be um, a case of mistaken identity. They were after Kim. Oh, I said, oh my God, that's so horrible to think. Gary knew that Patricia kept Kim stranded in her condo during the week. But Kim did have one responsibility, walking Patricia's dog. Based on that information, Gary surmised that Rose Gleason had traveled to Boshen with the intention of stabbing Kim Mervich. But in the darkness of North Boshen Drive, she had stabbed Margaret Kuhn instead. Kim wasn't there to walk her dog because she was in Baton Rouge with Pat Curry. But Margaret Kuhn was there walking her dog. It's unclear if Detective Jay Daigle shared Faye and Gary's mistaken identity theory. But a month after Daigle interviewed Faye, records show, he finally secured an interview with Patricia Curry. On January 24th, 1989, he sat down with her and Kim in Patricia's condominium. The only documentation of that interview is a one-page summary written by Jay Daigle. Apparently, Curry was uncooperative and would only agree to answer questions if the interview was not recorded. So there was no interview transcript. Instead, Daigle lists what he refers to as highlights. When asked about Margaret Kuhn, Patricia claimed that she knew her only from TV and newspaper accounts. Daigle then asked her about Rose Gleason. Curry replied that Rose occasionally came to Beauchene to harass her, causing Patricia to change the locks. The summary goes on to say that Rose Gleason, quote, wanted Kim out of the condo or Kim would be killed. What Detective Daigle didn't know was that Patricia had surreptitiously recorded the interview herself. The recording would soon find its way to Faye St. Germain. She had a tape recorder in a potted plant. And a few days later, that tape ended up on my doorstep. I I do not have it. Katrina took it. I had so much that I lost during Katrina, but I had that tape. On that tape, she sounded real confident and very, um, like, aggressive, you know? Like, what, what, do, what are you doing here? What, what are, you know, you have a nerve interviewing me, you know? She had that, that kind of attitude. I'm smarter than those cops. I know how to deal with them. In the wake of the interview, detectives would continue to ask other people about Patricia Curry. But it doesn't appear that they ever interviewed her again. Instead, detectives followed the suspect that Patricia gave them, Rose Gleason. In 1990, Jay Daigle was dismissed from the Kuhn investigation. He was replaced by detectives Ed Baroni and Clark Thomas. From notes Faye took at the time, Baroni and Thomas met with Faye and agreed with her theory that Margaret's murder may have been a case of mistaken identity. They also saw Rose Gleason as a potential suspect. Records show that in August 1991, Baroni and Thomas attempted to speak with Gleason at her home in northern Louisiana. But the interview never took place. According to an article in the Times-Picayune, Baroni and Clark were traveling north on Louisiana 159 when they ran a stop sign and broadsided a pickup truck. The impact plunged both vehicles into a ditch and killed an 81-year-old man riding in the passenger seat. Baroni and Thomas were briefly hospitalized with cuts and bruises. A few days later, however, Thomas checked back into the hospital after complaining of chest pains. Doctors wound up performing open-heart surgery, but Thomas died on the operating table. As we mentioned in episode three, Clark Thomas was a talented investigator known for storing case information in his head. His death dealt a heavy blow to the sheriff's office and put a hold on the Margaret Kuhn investigation. Years would pass before another investigator tried to contact Rose Gleason. Faye St. Germain was aware of detectives interest in Rose Gleason but her main priority was getting her daughter back. And in January of 1990, 
Three years after Kim left home, she finally received the call she'd been waiting for. And she said, Mama, I'm ready to come home. I said, okay. I said, all right. Uh, what are we going to do? She didn't have a car. She said, meet me across the street from the gate. So I called Gary, and I told him, I said, listen, Kim wants to come home. He, he said, oh, and I said, I'm scared. You know, I don't know what's going to happen uh, if Pat Curry finds this out. What we're going to do, I don't know. He said, look, I'm going to be in the parking lot, and I'll flash my lights, and I'll follow you to the bridge. So she comes out, and she comes with her little dog, and, and she gets in the car very quiet, and we go home. As I got her out of there, I, I began to think, well, oh my God, maybe this nightmare is over. You know, when it was really just beginning, just beginning. <laughs> and that's when the shit hit the fan. Faye thought bringing Kim home would end her feud with Patricia Curry. But in fact, it only made things worse. When Pat Curry found out she was gone, she started harassing us. And my daughter Jenny witnessed Pat Curry putting a note on my car. It said, if you don't back off, I'm going to kill you. Harassment, terrorizing me, uh, threatening me, threatening my family, just horrifying stuff. Stuff, stuff being thrown through my windows, um, death threats on my phone that I should have a bodyguard. Then she started handing out flyers and it hit Kim's picture and my phone number. If you want a good time, call. <laughs> And they had, they had people calling us. Um, oh, she's nuts. Kim and Faye spent the next two decades looking over their shoulders. To make matters worse, Faye and her new husband, Rudy, were forced to relocate to the North Shore after Katrina destroyed their home in St. Bernard. After the storm, I ended up moving to the North Shore, which I was very fearful of doing because I wasn't too far from Pat Curry, and I moved to Ponchatoula, which was a half-hour ride to Pat Curry's house. So my brother and my husband decided that I get a concealed carry permit. So I went to classes, and I uh, got a 38 snub nose. I keep my gun in the car, and so let me tell you, uh, I would think it might be a year ago, last summer. We went to Rouse's, which is very close to the gate of Beauchene. We were eating over there, and I saw a red Camaro with curry license, and I recognized the curry license. I told Rudy, oh my God, we not getting out this car. I'm not going in that store with her in the store. And that was the last time I really saw her. And then I'm seeing her on TV, you know, uh, trying to kill her attorney. I called Kim, I told her, and she said, really? And I said, yeah, get on, get on, uh, on the TV and you can play it back. And she's been arrested. It's about time, she said. It's about time that she slipped up and got caught. Yeah. Faye and Kim were relieved. They could finally relax knowing that the woman who had terrorized them for more than 25 years was going to jail. I was dancing. Look at her! <laughs> she finally did it! I was so happy to see that she actually did something that she couldn't get out of, you know? That she couldn't have an explanation, you know? I felt better about, you know, going shopping and all because I always was looking at my back, uh, you know, always. At the top of this episode, Faye described a piece of paper that she used to keep in her purse. It read, In case of my death, this is her, followed by Patricia's name, address, and date of birth. After Patricia was arrested, Faye stopped carrying the slip of paper. But she was not quite done with Patricia Curry. 
I was sitting um, on my, my sofa, and I think it was evening, and I see two men on my porch. I said, oh, okay, I see the cop badge here on his belt. I said, oh, man, more cops. Okay, so I opened the door, and I said, okay, it's about Curry. Yeah, I said, come on in. Just come on in. What you want to know? When I hear about all these different uh, incidents that happened between Kim, uh, Kim's family, and Patricia Curry, and it seemed like she had somewhat of a propensity for violence, I thought, oh, maybe I'm on the right track here. This is Skip Sewell again. After speaking with Faye, he realized the Mandeville police report was only the tip of the iceberg. I had been through the file, and there was a number of suspects in there, but everyone either got somewhat ruled out, uh, had an alibi, or seemed very unlikely. There just weren't that many good suspects in the case file. So I, I kept continuing to look at uh, Patricia Curry, and the main thing I wanted to do at that time is I wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth, which I wanted to hear it from Kim, and I wanted to interview her, but Faye was a little, uh, and rightfully so, a little protective of, of Kim. Faye knew Kim was fragile, but she convinced her to talk with Skip anyway. Eventually, Faye tells me, hey, Kim has agreed to speak with you. So I was excited about that. So I called uh, Kim. She was pleasant, cordial. And what I mainly focused on was the night before Margaret Coon was murdered in that morning. Kim slowly described what she remembered. And she said that that day that Margaret Coon was murdered, their next door neighbor walked over and said, hey, Patricia's on the phone. She wants to talk to you because they didn't have a phone in that condo. So, yeah, it must have been pretty awkward. You know, she can't get in touch with her um, because she takes the phone. So she walks over to the neighbor's house, and she talks to Patricia and says, listen, I want you to pack up. You're coming down to Baton Rouge tonight. Uh, I want you out of that condo as soon as possible. Kim says that the neighbors gave her a ride down to Baton Rouge and dropped her off with Patricia. Patricia, by all accounts, wasn't very neighborly. She had quite honestly pissed most of them off. I'm sure the neighbor probably didn't want to do it, but did it anyways. So when she gets down there that night, Kim had asked Patricia a few questions, like, you know, why did I have to get out of the condo? What's going on? She, Kim said, I had never been down to her place in Baton Rouge before, so I knew all this was bizarre, it was odd, but I wouldn't get any answers from Patricia. So that night we went to a Mexican restaurant. We went out to eat. Kim could not recall the name of the restaurant, but she told Skip they'd eaten sometime in the early evening. And I asked her, did Patricia get a receipt? And she says, yes, yeah, she got a receipt. And I said, do you think this is unusual that she got a receipt that night? And she goes, well, a little bit, but Patricia got receipts a lot of times. And did you remember what time you got finished? And uh, she couldn't really remember that. So I asked her, I said, well, did Patricia stay there with you all night? And she says, yeah, as far as I know, she did. The next morning, Kim said, Patricia gave her the keys to her car and told her to drive back to Boshin. She also gave her the telephone with specific instructions to call her as soon as she arrived. Kim was instructed by Patricia, as soon as you get home, I want you to call me right away, which I thought was obviously uh, kind of bizarre. Why did she need her to call her? I mean, she was emphatic about that. You, when you get home, call me as soon as you get in the condo as if she possibly knew something had happened or was going to happen or was scared about something. And when she pulls into the subdivision, the normal route she would take to the condo is blocked with fire trucks, sheriff's office, uh, vans, crime scene, uh, whatever they had at the time. was It was all blocked off. So she had to turn back around and come uh, in the opposite direction to get to her, her condo. When Kim finally made it into the condo, the first thing she did was plug the phone in. And when Kim did plug in the phone and call Patricia, she said Patricia was kind of like in a panic and was upset. We know, why haven't you called me earlier? What took you so long? And was kind of getting on to her. That's when Kim told her that there's all these fire trucks and police cars and something happened right outside in front of the condo. And Patricia 
told her, do not go out there. No matter what you do, I don't want you to go out there. She said she was adamant about her not going out to the uh, scene. Skip was baffled by Kim's story. I was baffled too when Skip first told it to me. And to be honest, it's a little confusing. So let's quickly summarize what she said. On the night of Margaret Coon's murder, Patricia Curry went to great lengths to get in touch with Kim, demanding that she leave the apartment immediately and join her in Baton Rouge. When they went out to eat that night, Patricia was adamant about obtaining a receipt. The next morning, she sent Kim back to Beauchen with the phone and insisted she call her the second she walked into the condo. And when Kim mentioned the ambulance and cops across the street, Patricia allegedly told her not to go out there, whatever you do. At this point, Skip cut to the chase. So, you know, I asked her point blank, do you think Patricia Curry had anything to do with it? And she goes, I'm not sure, but... I mean, I can't really say, but I don't think so. But at the same time, she was somewhat under her spell and scared of her. At the end of the day, Kim had no idea why Patricia was acting the way she was around the time Margaret Kuhn was killed. We reached out to Kim ourselves, but she declined to speak with us. She was in poor health and didn't want to revisit this traumatic period in her life. Skip stayed in touch with Kim after their meeting but she never revealed any more details about that day. And while Patricia Curry's behavior was highly suspicious, she did have an alibi. True, Skip never actually saw the restaurant receipt, but Jay Daigle did, and it was enough for him to dismiss her as a suspect. Based on what Kim told Skip, one conclusion is that Patricia hired someone to kill Margaret, or at least knew that the murder would take place but Skip and the detectives had no evidence of such a thing. So Skip turned his attention to the Rose Gleason theory. So Faye told me that Rose Gleason had called Patricia Curry and told her, you better get that bitch out of the condo. And I asked Faye, how how do you know this? And she said, well, Kim told it to me. And later on, when I spoke to Kim, she told me basically the same story. So... Coincidentally, Kim and Margaret Coon look very much alike. They uh, hairstyle, blonde hair. Margaret was a little bit taller, but they had uh, a lot of similarities. I remember when I was looking through the uh, district attorney's file, and I found a picture of Margaret, and I found a picture of Kim, and I put them side by side. That even furthered my belief that maybe this was a mistaken identity killing. So possibly Rose thought that maybe Margaret Coon was Kim. You know, again, it makes sense to me because they both walked the dogs where they were. They looked so much alike. It was uh, uncanny. In his spare time at the DA's office, Skip began looking into Rose Gleason. Uh, I had been told by Faye that uh, after the murder of Margaret Coon, Rose moved to California for two to three years approximately, which, again, very odd. So it made me more suspicious. I ran her down in North Louisiana, and I had a state trooper and a deputy sheriff go by the address I had for her, and they sat up and watched for a while, and a woman fit in Rose's description, age, height, weight, walked out and got the garbage can. So they told me that, uh, yes, we believe we got her up here. And yet, Skip never managed to interview Rose. No, never ever interview Rose. And uh, that's the one person that I really wanted to interview other than Kim. Never was able to interview her and uh, left the DA's office before I was able to do it. But we did manage to speak with Rose. When I called her cell phone this summer, she answered on the second ring. She asked that I not record the call. But after five minutes on the line with her, I couldn't imagine her killing anyone, let alone stabbing someone with enough force to shatter a rib. Gary Raymond was right when he said Rose was a nurse, but she was also a social worker. When I asked Rose where she was living in late February 1987, she thought for a moment before saying she was probably in Los Angeles. 
She'd moved there, she said, to get away from Patricia Curry. Rose told me Patricia had turned violent in the wake of their breakup. Among other things, she said Patricia had choked her in a supermarket parking lot and thrown a Molotov cocktail through her apartment window. And while she couldn't prove it, she strongly suspected Patricia had killed her Doberman Pinscher by feeding it a poisoned hot dog. Rose came to believe that if she didn't leave Louisiana, Patricia Curry would have killed her. Halfway through the call, I asked if Rose was aware that some people thought she'd killed Margaret Kuhn. She laughed and said that she was. In fact, she remembered the day that Ed Baroni and Clark Thomas had come looking for her. The man they'd killed in the car accident was her next door neighbor, and she was deeply saddened by his death. But Rose was unaware of the theory that she'd killed Margaret in a case of mistaken identity. She had never heard the name Kim Mervich, she said, and had no desire to harm anyone Patricia was dating. To the contrary, considering what she'd been through, she felt bad for whoever Patricia Curry was dating. I have to admit that, for a time, I'd suspected Rose Gleason had in fact stabbed Margaret Kuhn in the mistaken belief that she was Patricia Curry's girlfriend. But after 20 minutes on the phone with Rose, I was embarrassed for even entertaining the thought. Rose sounded sweet and gentle. More than that, she sounded like a victim. She reminded me of Kim and Faye, someone who'd survived a traumatic relationship with Patricia Curry. In the summer of 2019, Patricia Curry was convicted of attempted second degree murder. She had been offered a plea deal that would have earned her six or seven years, maybe less, but she decided to go to trial and testify in her own defense. The jury was not convinced. They deliberated for just 15 minutes before finding her guilty. At the age of 78, she was sentenced to 22 years in prison. Patricia is currently incarcerated at the Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women in St. Gabriel, Louisiana, not far from Baton Rouge. My request to interview her in prison was denied by the State Department of Corrections, partly due to COVID-19. So I decided to write her a letter and she wrote me back. During the summer, Patricia wrote me dozens of handwritten pages describing her travails with the Louisiana criminal justice system. When I got around to asking her about Margaret Kuhn, however, she stopped responding. There are many questions about Patricia's involvement in the Margaret Kuhn mystery that investigators failed to answer. Perhaps the biggest one is the nature of her relationship with Margaret. In her only interview with detectives, Patricia claimed she knew Margaret only from media reports. But several people we spoke with suggested that wasn't true. One of those people was her daughter, Janice Alexander. When I found out which neighbor it was, when I found out who, who Margaret Kuhn was, because I never connected the name to the lady in the condominium with the dog, but when I connected the two, I remembered that mom couldn't, couldn't stand her. That's when I said to myself, boy, she probably did kill her. If you have tips or information that you'd like to share related to the unsolved murder of Margaret Kuhn or other relevant topics, you can call us at 650-746-GONE or email us at gonesouthpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening to Gone South, a direction and production of C13 Originals, a Cadence 13 company. Executive produced by Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, along with John Liebman, Ken Lee, and Jared Shear. Written and narrated by me, Jed Lipinski. Directed by Lloyd Lockridge. Produced by Tom Lipinski. Edited by Alistair Sherman, with assistant editing by Molly Nugent. Research and production support by Ian Mont and Paige Heimson. Recording and engineering by Bob Tabador, Bill Schultz, and Sean Cherry. And mixed and mastered by Chris Basil. Original music written and performed by Casey Wayne McAllister. Production consulting by Skip Sewell. Marketing and publicity by Brian Swarth, Moira Curran, Hilary Schuff, and Josephina Francis. 
Cadence 13 is an Odyssey company.